Tashi Delay, and welcome to Tibet Talks. I'm Ashwin Brigis of the International Campaign for Tibet. On today's episode, we're going to have a conversation with you about something that's extremely exciting for us all. Two weeks ago today, Representatives Jim McGovern of Massachusetts and Michael McCall of Texas introduced a new bill that will renew and revitalize efforts to resolve the Chinese government's decades-long illegal occupation of Tibet through peaceful dialogue between Tibetan and Chinese leaders. This bill, known as the Promoting a Resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act, will make it clear that the conflict between Tibet and China is unresolved and that Tibet's legal status remains to be determined under international law. Perhaps best of all, the bill will pressure the government of China to return to the negotiating table with the envoys of the Dalai Lama. But that only scratches the surface of what this clarion piece of legislation will do. We know that many of you still have questions about the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act, and we'll get to your questions in just a few minutes. But first, although this legislation has only been in Congress for two weeks, it has truly been decades in the making. To provide some perspective on why the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act matters, I am pleased to introduce the interim president of the International Campaign for Tibet. Please join me in welcoming Bucheng Seren. Bucheng La, welcome back to Tibet Talks. Please share with our audience your views on this legislation. Thank you, Ashwin. And uh, I want to begin by uh, expressing my uh, thoughtful uh, Gratitude to the members of Congress for having taken this initiative on yet another initiative on Tibet. And as uh, you pointed out, I think we need to look at this legislation not in isolation, but in the co overall context of uh, the desire within Congress uh, on both sides of the aisle to uh, resolve, to help the Tibetan people resolve the issue of Tibet. Uh, in recent past, uh, I think you rightly pointed out, uh, there have been questions being raised within the Tibet movement and uh, members of Congress who support the Tibetan people uh, among general public as to what the new the United States administration is doing on Tibet. They sometimes they've been concerned that maybe the United States is not really uh, uh, interested in uh, following up on the issue of Tibet. Uh, our friends on Congress, they certainly have been continuing to sort of be mindful of the fact that the issue of Tibet has been unresolved and that until and unless uh, there can be a solution uh, to the issue of Tibet, the, this should be the position of the United States government. And therefore, over the years, uh, they passed the 2002 Tibet Policy Act in which they, uh, Congress formalized the United States, mandating the United States to take up a uh, resolution, resolution of the Tibetan issue as uh, the main role of the special coordinator. And uh, that was, uh, as we saw, uh, followed by several rounds of talks within the Dalai Lama's envoys and the Chinese leadership. Uh, in 2010, uh, the last round, such rounds were held, and thereafter we haven't had any uh, uh, resumption of the dialogue process, and Congress has been concerned about that situation, it has been looking at ways to uh, promote novel approaches to the issue of Tibet. Uh, therefore, in 2018, we saw the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act. In 2020, we saw the Tibetan Policy and uh, Support Act. All these were meant to provide the administration with the tool uh, to uh, help encourage the dialogue process on Tibet. So. The first thing we have to look at this, the new legislation, is to put it within that framework. Uh, it aims at the resolution of the unresolved issue of Tibet. Secondly, uh, we have to look at this uh, legislation in the context of the current uh, thinking in the international community on how to approach China. 
unlike in the past when countries felt that if you placate China, if you give in to Chinese whims and fancies, there may be possibilities that China might change for the better. And in the process, uh, the human rights and religious freedom or democratic rights or political rights of people like the Tibetan people can be respected and addressed and the Tibetan issue might uh, be resolved. Unfortunately, the Chinese authorities have taken it wrongly. Uh, they have seen that as the weakness of the international community and that they can do anything they want. So now in recent years, we have found uh, international community being more assertive on the issue of overall approach towards China. So from that perspective, this legislation can also be seen as Congress trying to uh, let the administration know that it can uh, look at the issue differently and that it uh, can look at the issue of Tibet promoting a dialogue process from the fact that the Chinese authorities should know that it doesn't have legitimacy or the issue of Tibet until it unloads the issues resolved through dialogue. And the legislation provides an avenue for that dialogue process. Thirdly, uh, when the Biden administration uh, came into power, it created much hope in the people in Tibet about something a more proactive initiative being taken by the administration. This was because uh, in 2020, when uh, the then presidential candidate uh, Joe Biden issued a statement on Tibet, it was a very strong statement committing himself to doing things uh, to help the Tibetan people. Uh, it was uh, also uh, clear when the Biden administration in its first year appointed the U.S. Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues, who is the point person uh, to deal with the issue of Tibet. Uh, Congress also was mindful of this uh, hope that the Biden administration had provided, and therefore in December 2021, we saw 60 members of Congress from both houses uh, write to uh, the Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues, Azra Zaya, laying out steps that the administration could take on the issue of Tibet. And I just want to quote from one aspect of that uh, letter which said, we un encourage the US government to engage earnestly with both sides, like-minded partners and experts to explore novel strategies that could produce forward movement, unquote, uh, on the dialogue process. So this legislation is part of that novel approach that Congress is trying to uh, show uh, to the administration. And uh, now, with the Biden administration uh, being faced with this legislation, even as this legislation goes to, uh, through its process in the Congress, we feel that Biden administration has enough uh, leeway to uh, see that a proactive uh, initiative is taken on Tibet so that it can help uh, resolve the unresolved issue of Tibet. And that is the way I think we should look at this legislation. Thank you very much, Ashwin. Bozuma, thank you very much for uh, coming on and sharing that valuable perspective with our audience. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I know that many of you still have questions about the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act. And so we want to give all of you the opportunity to get your questions answered during the show. So if you're watching this live and you have a question about the legislation, Please email your question to comments at savetibet.org or post them in the comment section of our Facebook live stream. We'll get to your question soon, but first, I'm excited to introduce someone who will play a key role in the effort to turn this legislation into law. He is the Director of Government Relations at the International Campaign for Tibet and a veteran of advocacy on Capitol Hill. Please welcome Franz Matzner. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Franz, as Ashley uh, introduced me. I thank you for that uh, kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here uh, to get into more of the details on the legislation and answer everybody's uh, questions as we go along. So uh, here I am, uh, ready to dive in. Thank you very much, Franz, and we're excited to have you here to talk about this really vital piece of legislation. So as I mentioned, we'll get to our audience questions soon, but first let's just kind of go over some of the basics of what the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act will do. So Franz, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I went over some of the details of what the, what the bill will do, 
but there's a lot more to it than just what I stated. Can you kind of give us a, the bullet list version of what the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act will accomplish? A absolutely. So uh, as already mentioned, but it does bear repeating that you know the primary uh, and central provision is uh, strengthening and clarifying the United States policy that the Tibet uh, you know issue is unresolved. Uh, and I would add my perspective, and I think one of the motivations behind the legislation overall is that this, this really comes at a critical juncture where the Chinese uh, government continues to put a lot of propaganda and resources behind the idea out there in the world that there is no conflict, that it's all been taken care of and that everything is wonderful under communist rule. Uh, and therefore, you know, any, any statements to the contrary or any uh, suggestion that there's anything wrong in Tibet is, uh, you know, is interfering with internal matter. And uh, you know, stating the, op the opposite, that this is unresolved, sends a strong message to the international community that the United States is continuing to support dialogue and does not consider this a you know, tabled discussion uh, and certainly not in the context of international law. Uh, so that is, a, a you know, again, I, I expand on that because it is the critical piece here and it's one of the reasons I'm coming right now. There are some other important uh, provisions. Uh, you know, one of them is uh, stating again that the policy of the United States is that the Tibetan people are a people. That may sound silly, because we all know that, but making that very clear and codifying that does have implications. And again, the stakes for the for the Chinese government that the United States is really putting out there that this is a separate identity and a separate culture that needs to be taken care of. Uh, linked to that is uh, the right of self determination. This is a uh, fairly uh, universal concept in international law um, and reinforcing that uh, in this legislation is again an, another pillar in in highlighting the uh the chinese government's approach which is to basically deny all of these things even even international laws that they have assigned on to uh, the the principle behind self-determination is exactly what it sounds like the tibetan people as a people have the right to determine their uh, own future, preserve their own culture, and uh, that that um, that that is you know of universal right. And reinforcing that, and then a third, extremely important part of that of the legislation that matches the above is that the Chinese government's current policies preclude the Tibetans from enjoying that universal right. Uh, that is a critical and novel aspect of the legislation. Uh, it directly challenges the Chinese concept that, ever, again, that everything is fine um, and that they have purview over all decisions related to the Tibetan people. Uh, the, um, there are a few other provisions in the bill. Uh, there uh, is a um, empowerment of the special coordinator to directly counter Chinese disinformation about the Tibetan people, His Holiness, and uh, the culture. Uh, the, there is a matching responsibility of the special coordinator to then report out in its uh, the annual report on of what it's been doing in Tibet to include now a section on what it has done and the resources it's committed to countering that disinformation. Uh, again, I can't, this is another step forward. Um, it gives the administration a tool um, to counter the Chinese propaganda again, that everything is fine. And when they put out statements to the contrary, uh, the administration is empowered, but also so is the civil society to bring that forward and say, look, according to the law, this needs to be countered. Uh, we cannot let this stand. Um, you know, continuing down the bullet list, there is also a very important, um, a codification of the definition, the geographic definition of Tibet. As we all know, it is often erroneously uh, confined to the TAR, um, but we all know, again, that there is and was far more uh, that constituted the Tibet and the Tibetan people's area. Um, and so this legislation will 
make that clear and include all of the Tibetan communities that were originally part of Tibet before China took over. And the, I think the last piece that's very important is that there is within the sense of Congress, which is a little different than policy statements, but within the sense of Congress, there is a refutation that of China's claims that Tibet has belonged, so to speak, to China since ancient times, which we all know is historically absolutely false. And it's one of the reasons his holiness will. Ashwin, I think those are the highlights, so I'd be happy to delve in any further. Yeah, thank you very much, Franz, for that really excellent overview of this vital piece of legislation. Very clear from what you said that there are a number of important provisions here about Tibet's history, its geography, its people, and their future. So thank you very much for running over that. Um, let's go back in time a little bit, though, and kind of talk about, if you will, the origin story of this legislation. So, of course, I remember very vividly when the Sikyong, the president of the Central Tibetan Administration, was here in Washington and had a number of really important meetings. And uh, many of us at ICT were fortunate to be able to interact with him as well. Um, it's my recollection, my understanding that the bill was discussed or the need for this bill was discussed in the U.S. Capitol at that time. Uh, is that true? Can you kind of go over what uh, what happened there? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I, I would, uh, you know, we can we can rewind even further into the past and look at some of the um, ongoing discussions within the policy make, policy making community, community, the academic community, uh, and the civil society community. That this is an issue that solved uh, and elevated. Um, but I'll start uh, a little bit more recently. Uh, so yes, uh, this young uh, did uh, come on his. Uh, First official visit to the uh, to visit and meet with the congressional leaders and the administration and um, to express that this the the thinking behind what became the legislation was uh, central to a, a new initiative, firm initiative um, by the Sikong and the Central Tibetan Administration to find and identify these novel ways to bring. Um, China back to the negotiating table, and this was going to be a priority. Uh, so there, um, as always, was a lot of uh, sympathy and support um, from among a lot of congressional offices on the legislation and the concept. Um, there was also um, direct dialogue with Speaker Pelosi, who, again, almost all of us know, has been one of the strongest, if not the strongest, advocate in Congress on uh, Tibet for many, many years. And uh, the, all of those voices, in, uh, including obviously the end of the day, um, the leadership from Mr. McGovern and Mr. McCall um, brought this concept from concept and need into uh, congressional legislation. Uh, and, and so that is the, the core of the, uh, you know, the origin and manifestation of the legislation. Thanks very much, Franz. And uh, we're starting to get some questions coming in, so we'll get to those soon. But um, let's kind of stay on this thread of conversation for a moment. Uh, what was the rationale for this legislation, would you say? Why did lawmakers decide specifically that this was the right bill at the right moment for the U.S. government to take up to help the people of Tibet? Well, at, at, the, at the risk of uh, repeating and echoing some of what um, Lu Chengla uh, has already uh, put forward, the, the central rationale is, I think, two, two elements. One, uh, everything that we've said about the need um, to, to move forward and find new ways to put more pressure and create more leverage to bring China back to the negotiating table and to set, set, uh, set a model for the international community. This is certainly something that other countries, uh, through their legislative process, could pick up. Um, so we hope that happens. Uh, the other motivation, I think, is a, a, what we're all seeing is a real reorientation by specifically the United States, um, but internationally towards what has been a growing authoritarian uh, stance internationally of, uh, from the Chinese government, particularly under Xi Jinping, increased human rights violations, whether that's uh, in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan, or um, Tibet, which once again, sometimes uh, the 
the level of, of that oppression and suppression and its brutality is hidden behind the firewalls, the technology, technological firewalls. Um, but we know what's happening. And at a time where many of the global stances and perspectives and literally the laws of uh, how we approach and see uh, China are undergoing revision and revisit and revisitation, it was clear that it was time to do that with Tibet and Tibetan policy as well. Uh, so I think that that was a primary rationale that not only was this a long time coming, um, but that the, that a, a clarity was needed and a stronger position uh, to counter what is clearly a ramped up aggression by China. Thank you, Franz. Um, let's talk about something that I know uh, you know you get very excited about. Uh, let's talk about the legislative process. So where are we now in the life cycle of this bill? What's happened so far and, and what steps need to be taken before this bill can become law? Right. So there are many pathways for legislation um, from introduction to becoming law, but it is a you know, multi-step process. Uh, so I'll admit that there are, so, there are so many different pathways that it's hard to you know, specify exactly how this piece of legislation. But, uh, you know, um, the gist of it is that a you know, bill is introduced. It becomes... Uh, you know, officially available for other members of Congress to co-sponsor and show their support. And that is the phase that we are in now. Uh, other members of Congress, uh, once again, as always, uh, from across the both aisles are being invited to join the legislation. And of course, all of us, community of compassion are working uh, together to, to support that. Then, so, uh, uh, after co-sponsors are generated, uh, there'll, uh, there'll be, uh, a process of bringing the legislation to a vote. And there are different ways to do that. Uh, it usually goes through, uh, the, it's called the Committee of Jurisdiction, which in this case is the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And, uh, there's consideration of, of the bill there. And there's many different versions of what that means. So I won't go into all of that right now because and we'd run out of time. Uh, and so we'll see that go, go forward. You know, we fully expect this, this legislation to get strong support. Uh, and so we are very hopeful that it will come out of the house. Uh, and, you know, we hope that'll be a speedy process. Um, and then that would uh, lead us to a parallel process in the Senate, uh, where we'll be looking for, uh, similar congressional leaders to introduce a version of the bill, if not the identical legislation, move similar process that I just discussed. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, assuming that both bodies pass the legislation in you know, quick succession, there'll be uh, a process where both uh, bodies, if there are any differences between the legislation, discuss how to uh, reconcile those. And then uh, that will be passed and uh, goes to President Biden to use his pen. And that's the date we're all looking forward to very eagerly. Um, I have just a couple more questions before we open it up to the audience. So one thing we always do at ICT is enlist the members of our incredible community of compassion that we have here and ask them to get to ask their members of Congress to support Tibet. So what can ICT members, Tibetan Americans and Tibet supporters do to help pass this legislation? There's, um, you know, there's multiple ways and they're all very important. Uh, you know, we will always, uh, celebrate the introduction of a critical piece of legislation, but it is the beginning of the race. And so it's time to put all of our collective shoulders behind it. That makes it worse. And, uh, so there are some, you know, immediate steps. The, you know, ICT has launched a petition drive. Uh, so you can see that um, on our digital channels, but it will also probably be hitting mailboxes as well. Um, those are, you know, um, those are direct appeals um, that can be sent to legislators, urging them to co-sponsor the bill. So we encourage everybody to look for that and um, take those actions. Uh, a second um, important uh, opportunity coming up is the annual Tibet Lobby Day. Um, that will focus very much on, again, gathering co-sponsors 
for this legislation. If we're already heading towards a vote, we'll be talking about that. Uh, so again, we hope people will look for that opportunity and participate. We expect an announcement to come out uh, very shortly on the exact dates and details of that. Uh, so please look be on the lookout. And then I would like to just uh, emphasize one other point. All of those are great tools and we really need them, but nothing is more effective than direct constituent outreach to members of Congress. So write those postcards in your own handwriting. Those are worth many, many, many emails. Uh, stop by your the offices, your state offices, uh, communicate your interest in this legislation as Tibetan Americans. Uh, this is a very important step. And so anything that can be done to get your uh, member of Congress in direct communication with a constituent is um, added value in a big way. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, so there are going to be many ways for our supporters and for the Tibetan American community and Tibet supporters writ large to reach out to their members of Congress and to ask for their support of this legislation. So thank you for sharing that. Um, you mentioned the petition that we have now where people can write directly to their members of Congress. Um, where can people find that? Or we can, uh, we'll share the URL uh, toward the end of this conversation as well. All right. Well, um, the petition is on our uh, website. Um, we have created a, a sub web page dedicated to the issue itself for people to get background information on the occupation and what that means in the timeline of uh, various uh, approaches to talking about it that have unfolded over time. It's an important aspect of this, some of the history. And there are uh, direct links on that website to um, the legislation and actions you can take to support it, including the petition. And that uh, URL is www.savetipet.org slash occupation. Um, I, I, uh, there, also, there will be, you know, monitor our, our social media. Uh, there will be many opportunities to find the links as we do information out uh, that can that can uh, help us move the bill forward. Um, and at the end of uh, the Tibet talk today, uh, there will be a specific link provided in the QR code that will hopefully make it quite easy for everyone to take immediate action, which we encourage because the day goes on. And, Sometimes time slips away from us. So please, as soon as you can, hit that QR code. Absolutely. Thank you, Franz. And uh, again, um, we are posting the link to get to the petition right now in the comments of our Facebook Live post. The direct link to get to the petition, just so all of you know, is www.savetibet.org slash resolve Tibet. So again, we'll put that in the comment section and then we will also share the link again at the end of this talk. So just hang tight for that. But right now, I'd love to uh, open it up to questions from all of you. So thank you to all of you who've been sharing your questions already. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask Franz a question about the bill, please email your questions to comments at savetibet.org or post them in the comment section of our Facebook live stream. So with that, Franz, let's take our first question from the audience. And again, thank you to everybody who has been writing in and asking about uh, this legislation. So first of all, this is an issue that you mentioned briefly, Franz, but this question comes from Kalsung Wangdu Sharsitsong. And thank you, Kalsung La. Uh, the question, Franz, is, is there any hope of more governments passing similar legislation to the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act? Uh I always answer questions about, is there hope with, there's always hope. So uh, yes, uh, and uh, there will be work to be done to bring that hope to fruition. Uh, you know, the legislative process, as we all know, in each uh, country is, is different. So the legislation will have to uh, be constructed based on that and move forward uh, based on those processes. And I, uh, you know, confess I'm not familiar with all of those, uh, hoping to learn more about them, but uh, I'm a veteran of U.S. <laughs> activism. Uh, my, I think that one of the uh, intentions uh, of International Campaign for Tibet is to use these tools as models, whether it's uh, the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act or TPA or TPSA, um, 
and this piece of legislation to get uh, those ideas in front of other parliamentarians so that it can be picked up. And that advocacy will continue. We are an international organization with offices, different parts of the world. Uh, so that, so as this process moves forward domestically, uh, that is certainly our hope and um, belief that it can. Thank you, Franz. And uh, it's a good segue actually to our next question, which also deals with an international issue. So I don't know to what extent um, we can answer this, but the question is from David Patterson. And thank you, David, for the question. Can the U.S. bring this bill during the next Security Council, as an U.N. Security Council, with China being a permanent member? I uh, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, the uh, you know the, the first step to even having that opportunity would be to see it pass here and turn it into a law. But we need Biden's signature on this legislation as soon as possible uh, to fulfill that commitment. Um, that he has put forward so many times to fulfill the perspective that was included in Secretary Blinken's wonderful speech that included specific uh, reference to the inability for China to hide its human rights violations behind a, you know, the, the let's call it what it is, outright lie that what happens in Tibet, uh, you know, stays in Tibet like Vegas. It doesn't work that way. These are cultural genocidal acts and there's no way to hide it and no excuses. So, you know, yes, we, we are, you know, hopeful that this will catch the attention um, and gain momentum outside of the United States. But, but the reality is, is that's going to have to happen here first. Absolutely. One, one foot in front of the other. Right? Um, next question comes from a member of ICT and a longtime friend of ours, uh, Connie Arco. Or could, excuse me. Sorry, Connie. Thanks for uh, for writing into us. Um, so, Franz, Connie asked, what are the practical ramifications of this bill once enacted into law? What are the incentives for China to engage in a dialogue with representatives of Tibet, particularly given that the P PRC does not recognize that separate entity? So, a very good question. How does this bill help with all of that? Well, uh, at the risk of, of repeating ourselves, you know, the this the central idea is that for uh you know now over a, a decade well over a decade you know, china has simply ignored calls to come back the international community the united states continues to do that uh in many forms um unfortunately uh at the same time as uh quite clearly and consistently calling for resolution through dialogue and negotiation uh there have been you know, mixed signals, even sometimes in documents and statements that include the call to resolve this and imply that Tibet is part of China. So it's uh, very difficult to simultaneously say you need to resolve an issue and then say that China has already gotten what it wants. Uh, so the, the central intent here of Congressman, Congressman are leading this legislation disrupt that tactic by China. They are very opportunistic. Uh, they'll jump on any inconsistency or perceived inconsistency and use it as a weapon um, to, you know, from one, we've seen one classic example, a wonderful example of, uh, you know, a statement from uh, the United States president saying that, you know, they continue, they consider this a important issue and support a resolution through dialogue with his holiness. Uh, and then a immediate statement by Chinese leadership saying that even such a statement as that is reneging on their commitment to acknowledge Tibet as part of China. So, so simply saying, let's talk, gets that kind of reaction from China. And it's quite deliberate to try to continue, um, not only its propaganda towards the United States, but to give their cadre of supporters that they spend a lot of time building up. Uh, from other nations to echo it and make it real simply by repeating it. Uh, so this legislation would disrupt that tactic and give, again, give the administration more tools. And to be, you know, clear, this will be a law that mandates that that happens. And that's a, a, a very um, important step. So that kind of inconsistency and statement gets erased. Uh, thank you, Franz. And um, 
We have another question here that uh, there's another issue that kind of comes up that people are asking about in relation to this bill, which is the uh, one China policy. And so the question here is uh, from Tenzin Wozer Tachi Song. Thank you for the question. Um, so Franz, this legislation appears to me as the most significant statement, legally speaking, as we are no more only talking about human rights issues, but Tibet status, the Sino-Tibetan conflict, and the right to self-determination of the Tibetan people. So if this legislation were to pass, would that mean the U.S. would be renouncing to a, renouncing uh, abiding by the one China policy? Would there be any differences between the Congress and the executive, as the latter may not be ready to go that far to prevent any more military escalation in the region? So very good question, and it was a long question, so let me try to break that down again. Um, so I definitely agree. Uh, this question says, that, you know, this is a very significant statement. That's that's absolutely right. So let's try to take these one at a time. If this legislation were to pass, would that mean that the U.S. would be renouncing abiding by the one China policy? And would there be any differences between what Congress is saying and what the executive is saying? Uh, it, um, that is a, you know, admittedly very complicated question, more complicated than it may seem at value. Uh, the intention of the legislation, uh, at, you know, at least as a starting point in face value, is not to directly uh, challenge or directly mandate that the you know, the U.S. administration um, overtly alter that that position. That is certainly something we would all advocate for. It is Tibet has been occupied. We know it's an occupation. There are um, delicate, um, from the administration's perspective, perhaps overly delicate and sensitive uh, aspects to their perspective. This piece of legislation, though, uh, focuses on this idea that there is no resolution. It has not been resolved and that the administration uh, should be empowered and should be consistent in stating that. I, that is uh, the biggest aspect and the biggest change in this legislation. Yes, um, from our perspective, uh, should this become law, it would mandate that uh, the administration consistently put that forward as its um, negotiating position that this needs to happen and that the only meaningful peaceful way for this to go forward is through negotiations uh, and very important addendum to that is the legislation is stating clearly that the status of tibet is not just simply unresolved but it hasn't been unresolved by uh according to international law uh, and and that is a strong uh, signal and implication that, you know, it is time to bring and that the United States under this bill uh, would expect the China to live up to commitments to international law instead of continuing to pay lip service. Thank, thank you, Franz. And uh, thank you so much to everybody for all of these really interesting and thoughtful questions. You guys are great. We really appreciate all of your support. Once again, a reminder, if you have any questions for Franz about the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act, please post them in the comment section of our Facebook Live post. Or if you're watching this on our website, you can email your questions to comments at savetibet.org. We have just a few minutes left here. So let me ask you this, Franz. Um, this is the third major Tibet bill in just four years. Uh, we had the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act that became law in 2018, and then the Tibetan Policy and Support Act that became law in 2020. Um, how does this new bill complement those pieces of legislation? And similarly, why do you think we are seeing this surge in U.S. support for Tibet over the past few years? The simple answer is the, the level of uh, oppression uh, has increased dramatically, and that is, you know, a known fact. It's maybe a little hard to get some of the, um, you know, uh, pictures on the ground that startle all of us because of the Chinese, uh, you know, very firm uh, surveillance system that's been put in place, which we can't ignore as a, as a human rights violation. Um, this is uh, aimed directly at freedom of speech, freedom of movement, uh, and it's, you know, may not look the same as 50 years ago, but it is pervasive. 
And so this is not unknown to the U.S. administration and to Congress. Uh, so the you know, escalation is being matched by uh, increased focus. And of course, so that's, that's the first part. The second is uh, what we've already talked about is the recognition, I uh, the loose paraphrase that uh, from, again, the Blinken speech and, and, and what we're seeing and hearing from them, many, many members of Congress that uh, you know, there's, China has become a strategic competitor, uh, perhaps a polite phrase for something else. Uh, so in that context, this needs to happen. Um, you know, there are other examples, which I am definitely not an expert on, uh, but we're seeing another arenas as well, whether that's techno technology transfer uh, or, you know, investments, domestic investments in um, problematic uh, resources like solar panels uh, being produced using, um, I don't know the right word, forced labor. Uh, so this is keep in keeping with, with all of that. And I think that our a large community of Tibet supporters in Congress want to ensure uh, that the uh, momentum that's been building uh, now around Tibet policy is included in that uh, revisitation, necessary revisitation of what's going on in China, you know, and it faces it with eyes, up, eyes wide open. Um, so I, I think that's part of it. And then I would say that the third is it's a natural process. The natural process, legislative process, you move a piece uh, forward. I think some people, uh, I will say this, I, I think sometimes there is uh, a misunderstanding that uh, a lot of laws, especially um, civil rights laws, sort of come out of nowhere in whole form. And it's an all or nothing game. That's simply not true. Like most legislation, but particularly in this arena, there are many steps to getting it. And if you look to get everything all at once, it's unrealistic. So what we're seeing here is uh, a wonderful process of building on foundations and then adding to that. Uh, and this is a direct outgrowth of that. You can see it in the wording of the legislation. Yeah, and, and on that note, Franz, um, RADA, the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, was bipartisan. TPSA, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act, also bipartisan. And now we have the Promoting a Resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act. And that's also bipartisan. Representative McGovern is a Democrat from Massachusetts. Representative McCall is a Republican from Texas. I think everybody is aware that we're living through a age of intense polarization in the United States. And yet with one piece of legislation after another, we have seen incredible bipartisan support for the United States across both Democratic and Republican Congresses and Democratic and Republican administrations. What does it say about the fact that U.S. support for the Tibetan people continues to be bipartisan. Well, personally, I attribute that uh, directly to the charisma and um, message of His Holiness, the the sanctity and wisdom of His words. Uh, they apply um, and they move people. They move people at a, at the, it, it, from their hearts. Uh, and it's not an, that's not an issue that can be politicized or turned into an electoral you know, wedge. This is something that comes from the heart. Uh, and it's, uh, something that has been a core of, for many administrations, as you say. Uh, and it's a point of, uh, agreement that is, you know, uh, it's, it's very powerful, as you said, at a, at a time like this, but, Agreement on this level of oppression, on um, religious uh, interference, is common ground, um, often common ground, but particularly in the case of his home, because of the message of compassion and understanding, it, it, it draws people in. Yeah, absolutely. And Franz, we're uh, starting to get toward the end of the program here, but we do really want to, again, express our gratitude to the members of Congress who have introduced this piece of legislation and who have been supporting Tibet for many, many years. Um, so again, it was Representative McGovern and Representative McCall who introduced the Promoting a Resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act. Can you share with our audience what these two men, these two members of Congress have said about the bill so far? And similarly, I know that Speaker Pelosi, who's also been a champion of Tibet, 
And she spoke about the legislation herself at the World Parliamentarians Convention on Tibet, which took place right here in D.C. just last month. What have these members of Congress said about the bill so far? Well, it's always a little dangerous to try to uh, quote a member's Congress. They're pretty articulate. But what we have uh, heard uh, and is definitely present in their press releases and quoted in our own is uh, both of the sentiments that, that we're uh, summarizing here, that the, you know, the current this is this is I would say comes uh, very much from the perspective of, if I may, from Representative McGovern, that the current approach simply isn't working, uh, and that it's time to recognize that uh, and find uh, new paths forward that um, you know that, that that bring the Chinese to the table, and uh, and the way to do that is to create new leverage as a tool, uh, and that that's been missing in the equation. Um, and so, you know, the, the provisions that I just outlined certainly match that perspective. Uh, you know, uh, Representative McCall is, you know, echoing that for sure. It's central to the bill and he's central to the leadership of the bill. Um, but we have also heard, um, you know, an emphasis from Mr. McCall on, you know, the, the tyranny and that has been ongoing and that it cannot be ignored and the lies um, about uh, the historical illegitimacy of, uh, you know, China's statements is, is a, is, a, is something that needs to be contended with directly. Uh, so I think between the two, they're, uh, hand in glove, good partners, peanut butter and jelly. They really <laughs> express, um, the, the, the multiple aspects of this in very strong terms and for their, uh, leadership on this, you know, when uh, this comes directly from their congressional uh, you know, perspective and um, desire to lead on this issue. Thank you, Franz. Um, so we're getting close to the end of the program here, as I mentioned, but I do want to give you a chance for a final word. Is there anything that hasn't come up in this discussion so far that you'd like to mention, or if there's any kind of last message you want to leave with our, with our audience? Um, what else do people need to know about the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act, and where do we go from here? Well, I think, you know, uh, guided by your excellent <laughs> facilitating, we've covered a lot of the main provisions. Um, the, just for the sake of being comprehensive, you know, another good sign of legislation is that there is authors funding, um, to provide more support, uh, for the special coordinator to undergo the, uh, countering disinformation. So it's not just rhetorical. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, what I would, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes lost in looking at a piece of legislation because you want to see what the policy statements are that are going to, you know, be uh, concrete, but the, but the extensive findings, which is basically the statements of support and evidence that comes before the statements of policy are quite comprehensive and they, they really establish that for quite some time, um, the United States and other countries have um, spoken about Tibet as an occupied country. Uh, and that's significant, um, that, that there is a long history of, of, of calling it the way it is. And we need to revitalize that. And so that is something that we can all point to. Um, and, and so I think that that's an important part if you're inclined to go read the whole piece of legislation, I would encourage looking at that. It's very informative, um, they, sometimes eye-opening. Um, so I encourage that. And uh, the other piece that I think cannot be, uh, you know, uh, underemphasized is that the package of this, each provision has its own life, um, but together it's telling a story and putting forward a a necessary tool combined that we need to expose what is the reality. We need to provide tools to counter it and clearly state consistently that this is an unresolved issue in international law. Uh, China is not living up to its expectations. They set expectations out at the very beginning of the evasion, which may be contradictory because it was an act of aggression. Right after you have an act of aggression, that is not a valid way to take control of a nation. 
It's a bottom line. It's in international law and it's also an ethical matter. Uh, so when you look at this piece of legislation through that lens, there's multiple ways that that is real. So I would, again, get on, get on the bandwagon and give us uh, some, as much help as you can to get it passed into law. Thank you, Franz. I think it's a great note to end on and very well said. So thank you so much for, for being part of this conversation. Um, with that, we are just about out of time. I'd like to thank Franz and Bucheng again for sharing their perspective and their expertise on this legislation. And of course, I also want to thank all of you who are watching and listening from home. Your support, again, means the absolute world to us. So uh, I also would like to mention that I'd like to thank you in advance for everything that I know that all of you will do to help us make the Tupo owning a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act the official law of the United States. It was because of your support that the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act and the Tibetan Policy and Support Act became law, and we know that all of you will step up to make the same thing happen with this legislation. So please visit, as Franz mentioned earlier, www.savetibet.org slash occupation to learn more about the bill. And please go to www.savetibet.org slash resolve Tibet to tell your members of Congress to pass the Promoting a Resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act. So right now we're sharing on the screen the URL, again, it's savetibet.org slash resolve Tibet. We also have a QR code here. If you scan this with your phone, it'll take you directly to the petition. You can fill it out and you can let your representatives know that you want them to support the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act. So please do scan that QR code and please do go to that URL and take action today to support the Tibetan people. Thank you all again so much for watching this episode of Tibet Talks. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be back next month with another episode for all of you to enjoy. Until then, as we always say on Tibet Talks, stay safe, stay well, and stay active. Thank you. Until